have you ever thought somebody had Down syndrome, it turns out they're Scottish? Has that ever happened? It's not my best day, uh, but that was a real thing that happened. I used to work down the street here, and uh, this guy came in, and I looked at him, and I was just like, all on your own. Fuck yeah, man. All right, just treat him like anybody else. <laughs> and then he started talking, and he was like, garf gar 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 like how they talk. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you're Scottish. You're Scottish. I, I literally said out loud, I said, you're Scottish. <laughs> and he was like, oh. <laughs> He's like, what'd you think? I was Irish? And I was like, yeah, that's totally. Let's go with that. Um. No, it is great to be doing this here at uh, Third Wheel. This is actually in the old Charlie Chaplin studios. That's what this used to be. And before that, it was actually uh, stolen Indian land. That's actually what this is This is built on, is stolen Indian land. I don't know if you know. It all is. It all is. You can literally say that anywhere you go in this continent. You can say that. I know. I said Indian. People are like, hey. Hey. You're not supposed to say that. It's Native American. That doesn't feel better, does it? <laughs> like, they're not, they're just like, hey, America, that's your word. That's fucking your, like, it's like if somebody broke into your house and took over your house, and they're like, don't worry, you can still live here, but you're Native Scott now. You'd be like, do not fucking say Scott again. I do not want to hear that goddamn word. They must hate the homeless, huh? Native Americans? <laughs> right? Because they're, they're just like, you just let their, put their tents up fucking anywhere? You burned our teepees to the ground and you just let them put their tents anywhere they fucking want to. There's a park uh, in North Hollywood called Tahunga Park, filled with tents, right outside. Native American guy going, I'm Tahunga. This shit is... <laughs> You named it after me. Could we have it back? We're not gonna, though. We are not gonna. Nobody, anybody own a house here? You could give it to a Native American right now. You could say, sorry, here you go, and fucking move back to Germany or wherever you're from. None of you are gonna do it. That one is done. That, a lot of social justice happening. Not that one. It's like Black Lives Matter protests, there's the women's marches, um, and then there was like anti-marches, Trump marches, and, and anti-maskers and shit, and it all happened on stolen Indian land. <laughs> and everybody is like, what side are they on? And they're like, please leave. We do not want any of you here. You're fighting in our living room. <laughs> 9 11 happened on stolen Indian land. <laughs> they're like, 3,000 people died here, and they're like, a lot more died here, actually. <laughs> they were digging through, looking for bodies, and then they started finding older bones, and they're like, all right, gone too far, gone too far. <laughs> You want to know a fun 9-11 story? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. How many, how many stories can you start that way? Uh, but no, September 10th, uh, 2001, twas the night before 9-11, and six of the hijackers stayed uh, at a Motel 6 in Portland, Maine. I know that I'm from Maine, and uh, it was big news there. They stayed there, uh, and they went to the strip club around the corner. It was called PT Show Club. PT stood for pussy time. Um, <laughs> these are six highly devout Muslim men, some as young as 19, had maybe never seen a naked woman before in their life, and they went to a strip club in Portland, Maine, and then still went through with 9-11. <laughs> Maine pussy couldn't stop 9-11. It could, couldn't even make it late for a 6 a.m. flight. 
the first pussy this guy ever saw. And he still woke up in time for that fucking flight. I like to think they had given up on it. They were like, fuck, this is crazy. We're not doing this. And then they're like, we're going to the strip club. Fuck all this. And then they walked in there and they're like, we're back in. We're back in. Because I've been there. It's not great. It is not... Maine's not like Vegas. Our best and brightest aren't at strip clubs. Um, I left there believing in Sharia law. I was like, yeah, fucking cover them up. Don't let them drive. That is terrible. <laughs> and now I have a daughter. I am a new father. I have a little girl. Thank you. Thank you. I had, uh, uh, me and my wife, we had a COVID baby. Uh, anybody here, uh, parents, COVID baby? No, dude, I fucking, oh yeah, you guys are having a COVID baby, better than an AIDS baby. If you're gonna pick a pandemic, <laughs> go COVID every time, are you kidding me? And for you that don't have a kid, for guys, fucking do it. Seriously, it's amazing. To come with purpose is, <laughs> Incredible. And like, if you have a kid by accident, you don't know what I'm talking about. Cause you were like, oh no. And I was like, go get him. <laughs> and they did, and they did. And you're just like, I can't believe it. <laughs> we had so much fun when my uh, wife was like eight months pregnant, walking around Venice and Santa Monica, telling people we're not keeping it. It was, <laughs> The best, because she was like this fucking big, and people would be like, oh, congratulations. I was like, we're not, don't worry about it. <laughs> the most liberal people in the world would be like, that is a lie from like, I fucking caught you. I caught you slipping. I found your line. And I'd turn, and I'd just start punching her, and I'd be like, her body, her choice, bitch. The first time I did it, I didn't tell my wife I was gonna do it. I just, I just, fucking, I just did it and I was like, we're not. She's like, what are you doing? And then she looked back at the woman and she was like, we're doing this more. That was a lot of fun. That was. <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to be a dad. Uh, I didn't have the feeling uh, I just didn't have the feeling like I, in me that, you know, a lot of people always say like, every, they always knew that they wanted to be a parent. I didn't have that. I'm so glad I did now. My wife always wanted to be a mom. I always wanted to fuck a pregnant woman. And <laughs> I have lived my dream now. I've gotten to live my dream and uh, for about nine months and now I'm trying to figure out how to be a dad. <laughs> I'm joking, guys. <laughs> not nine months, it's uh, more like six, because you want to feel it. You want to know that it's there. A threesome is a threesome, you guys. If you're Christian, that is a life and they are involved, okay? <laughs> Dude, when you come in a pregnant woman, uh, I just wonder, does the semen still go to where it thinks it's supposed to go and then it just gets there and there's a baby there and there's like, oh shit, guys, what are we supposed to, this is not, what we're expecting at all, and just. That's my impression of semen, too. Just, uh, shifting. It's like a bunch of dudes showing up to a gangbang and there's just a baby there, you know? And they're just like, we still doing this? What's happening? We didn't have a pregnant baby, though. Don't worry about it. Uh, We did fuck all the way through the pregnancy, though. Yeah, we fucked all the way through. If I could describe pregnant sex in one word, sloshy. It is because the pussy, uh, it gets ready. Uh, do you know that? It gets ready. Like a few weeks before uh, you get ready to give birth, the pussy like gets, it like salivates. It's like, like it fucking gets. <laughs> you know when you like rub your tongue around your teeth, like. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what it does. It gets ready. And so you're just like, this is wet. This is wetter than I have ever. This is not because of me wet. This is, you've only ever felt going in wet. This is, I got to spit some shit out wet. 
The doctors told us uh, a good way to induce labor was to have sex. And I was like, you mean I got to fuck this thing out of there, too? I fucked it in there, and I got to fuck it out of there? How long am I going to be fucking this kid along? Just got to get her into a good grade school. You know how I go. I was, just... I was fucking my wife in that scenario. I was, I was not actually fucking the kid along. I was... Uh, it's, uh, it's been pretty amazing. Uh, she actually uh, walked in on my wife giving me a blowjob the other day. Yeah, apparently she's walking now. Uh, we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't know that, but we did get on camera. Uh, and <laughs> subscribe to our OnlyFans if you want to see her first step. <laughs> It wasn't a blowjob, it was sex, but a blowjob is so much funnier uh, to try to explain to a child. Right? Because, like, sex, you could be like, oh, we were wrestling, or even like, this is how, you know, you procreate. But a blowjob is like, I was demeaning your mother. Uh, that was, I was just... Sometimes people like when somebody else feels less than. Uh, <laughs> It's been amazing having a little girl, because uh, I finally, for the first time, uh, know what it's like to have a woman truly appreciate me. And that's been, that's been nice. And I'm nothing against my wife. She's wonderful. She loves me. But I have never come home and had my wife be like, ah! <laughs> never happened. So fucking step your game up. That's all I'm saying. It's just... She'll like run, she'll be like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> we named her Wild. We named her Wild, W-I-L-D-E, because we figure a lot of strippers change their name to the stripper name. And um, the key is start with the stripper name. That's how you keep them off the pole. By the time she's 12, she's going to be so sick of people being like, I bet you are wild that she's like, no, nah, I'm licking puss for the rest of my life. I'm like, fuck all you dudes. <laughs> Trying to make a lesbian. Um, I know they say it's not a choice. I think it is. I think it's the parent's choice. I think we hold the power. I can just be like, I can fucking make you gay or straight, whatever you don't want to be. Just fucking clean your room. Um, <laughs> I do think she's Republican, though. Uh, I think I have a right-wing baby. Uh, she, a few things. One, she's super anti-abortion. Um, yeah, she's like, you mean me a year ago? No, not cool at all. Those are some of my friends you're talking about. And I know, abortion, hot topic right now. Everybody wants to get one. Nobody wants to be one. Um, she also loves Ben Shapiro. Yeah, she does. Because, I mean, my baby's Jewish, he's Jewish. I think she thinks he's a Muppet. I don't know. And uh, she just spoke her first words the other day, and they were, let's go Brandon. So I think I have a little right-wing baby. We brought her to the pediatrician, and uh, the nurse came out, and she goes, Wilde? Wilde? It's W-I-L-D-E. Yeah. She was this old black lady, and we're just like, over here, well, these parents. And she walks over, and we're just like, it's actually pronounced wild. And she just goes, mm-hmm, and turns <laughs> and walks away like black people don't name their kids crazy things, too. <laughs> like, if it was Wildy, it would be W-I-L apostrophe D. That's how you'd spell Wildy. She knows it. Something I have not liked uh, since becoming a father is anytime I say something funny around the house, my wife is like, oh, dad joke. Oh, look at that dad joke. Ooh, dad joke. I have been doing comedy for 11 years, way before this bitch came along. I am a funny person. That is what I do around the house. Now all of a sudden, she's here. They're fucking dad jokes. 
Do you know why they're called dad jokes? Anybody know? It's because moms aren't funny. That is why we are the only ones trying to bring a little levity to a very stressful situation. And you want to shit on us for it? And moms, it is, it's not your fault. You do not have time to be funny. You're trying to keep that shit alive, okay? That's your job, and we're here to just be like, oh, look at little Dame Drooly Dench. Like, that's what we do. This is a mom joke. A mom joke is, uh, I put her diaper on backwards, and then she laughs for 20 minutes and starts crying and blames it on you. That's a mom joke. You're like, I didn't see where that was funny at all. I don't know. <laughs> I'm scared, though, raising a kid in L.A. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm from Maine and shit, and... I'm just worried, I don't know, schools here are weird. I'm worried I'm gonna send her to school. First day, she's gonna go in and come back and they're gonna be like, she has ADHD or uh, anxiety or some shit and then they wanna put her on Adderall or Xanax and, and I just take all of her pills. Uh, <laughs> sincerely worried about that. <laughs> about becoming the best father ever. Are you kidding me? If I had a line on Adderall and Xanax, I am here for you day and night, baby. I'll never get mad, just fucking even keel right on that Zanny bar line. Just drag her into the pediatrician and go, hey, Wildy's here, she can't get her dick up. What do you got for her? I think it's all that Xanax she's been snorting. She was supposed to snort that, right? It was snorted or up the butt, and that seemed rude. Um, no, I'm lucky. My dick still works. I'm bald, though. I, I've, I've lost my hair. I've gone bald. Uh, but oddly, I, I just keep looking better and better. It's amazing. I'm like a less hateful Andrew Tate. Like, I just... For whatever reason, I just keep looking better and better. Do you know how hard it is as a white guy to go bald and pull it off? <laughs> There's just as many of us as there are black guys who go bald and can't pull it off. <laughs> it's like five on either side of the spectrum. It's me, uh, Statham, um, Sinead O'Connor and uh, I don't know, Amber Rose. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I lost my virginity, though, when I was 14. That's what this fucking did with hair. You're lucky I don't have hair anymore. You're fucking this whole room right now. I was. I was 14. Anybody younger than 14? A little squiggles, okay. Uh, good, that's good. Other, you were molested if you were. Um, no, I was 14, she was 13, and uh, wasn't her first time. Was, yeah, she fucking stole my virgin, like, she, <laughs> fucking. And then years later, years later, I talked to her and she actually told me it was her first time. She fucking lied to me. So much of my personality was based on the fact that this vixen, this fucking whore, had stolen my virginity, and now it turns out I just fucked a 13-year-old. I was 14. It's always important to point that out anytime you say you fucked 13-year-old. We hooked up in high school once, too, and dude, still fit. Are you fucking kidding me? I grew up in a small town, though. That's why that happened, the 14, 13 thing. I think that's why. I'm going to blame it on that. I don't know. <laughs> it was a small town. Uh, I knew and was related to a lot of people there. Anybody here from a small town? Woo! Yeah? Whereabouts? Gardnerville, Nevada. Gardnerville, Nevada. Yeah, I feel like you could relate with this. Uh, the first boobs I ever touched were my step-second cousins. <laughs> and... <laughs> Our family had to get together 
we told them we were dating and they had to get together with like the family trees and make sure it was cool. And they're just like, <laughs> they're like I guess it's by marriage step. It's like street ball, no blood, no foul. And <laughs> those are the first boobs I ever touched. First black guy, uh, I remember meeting uh, the first black guy I ever met. I remember, that's probably too late, right? <laughs> when it's a memory? When it's a solid memory. That shouldn't be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember it was a school field trip. Um, not to meet a black guy. Uh, <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was to like this, uh, this uh, machine shop mill thing and we were gonna go find out uh, how mills work and then there was just a black guy there and everybody in my class was like, holy shit. And, we all took pictures with him. I don't even know what he did there. I have no idea what that guy did there, but it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I grew up in a little town in Maine. It was, it was that small. I remember thinking uh, when I lived in Maine that uh, people didn't talk to me. That like people just didn't strike up conversations with me out of nowhere. And then I left Maine and moved to Boston. And all of a sudden, everywhere I went, every black dude talked to me. Every black, and that's when I realized it was like, oh, white people don't talk to me. That's what it is. I've just lived in Maine so long, I realized that. And, I got, and it got to a point where it got annoying to my wife because we would be at a bar and she would walk away and come back and I was talking to a black dude and she's like, again? I'm like, I didn't. It just happens. In my mind, I think black people love to talk to me. I think in reality, black people are like, oh shit, he has never met a black person before. We're gonna go say hi before he ends up on the other team. How you doing, buddy? I was telling that to a friend of mine, uh, and his girlfriend was there, and she was black, and she just goes, oh yeah, I'd talk to you. And I go, what is that? And she goes, you look like you've been hurt. <laughs> She's right, she's right, I am. But yeah, it was crazy. I didn't move to Boston until I was 29, so I didn't really live around any other races or cultures until 29, and it was just crazy to have that experience and realize I fucking love black people. Second favorite race, for sure. I feel like some of you wanna know number one before you go ahead and and laugh at that, so okay, let's rank them. Um, <laughs> you, you demanded. Uh, number one, when I moved to Boston, I started working at this bakery and I worked with uh, mostly uh, Latinos. Latino, Latina, Latinx, if you're a white woman. And <laughs> they were great. They, uh, they really helped me uh, fit in in Boston. Uh, and still know some of them to this day. They're number one for sure. Black people, number two. Asians, three. Uh, only because I don't care for how old Asian ladies cross the street. They just don't give a shit what the traffic light says or anything, and they just put a hand up and start waving it and start walking, and for some reason, everybody stops, and I'm like, is that magic? I don't know. Number four, uh, white people, because by the numbers, you have wronged me more. Um, <laughs> And I think that's all the races. I think I uh, did it there. I miss one? <laughs> Shout them out. Did I miss anything? Native American. Well, that was a lot of different groups of people that span a giant area and for you to lump them all together like that. <laughs> say it's a bit rude. Somebody one time said uh, Middle Eastern and I did that same shit I just did to you. Uh, <laughs> this is a bunch of different countries and shit and they're like, they all hate each other. I don't know. And then they're like, Saudi Arabian. I was like, oh, they are white. Uh, yeah, they're white, because they just do whatever the fuck they want, and nobody gets in the way. Like, they kicked over two buildings, and people are like, get that other country. Um, 
Some white shit, if I've ever seen it. Uh, somebody mentioned it earlier. Uh, any Nirvana fans here? You got some Nirvana fans? Yeah. I grew up in the 90s, too. Yeah. I fucking love Nirvana growing up. I love I love everybody in that 27 Club, but like because I grew up at the time, Kurt Cobain, I fucking love Nirvana. A lot of people think that uh, Courtney Love killed Kurt Cobain. Yeah. I think if you look at the evidence and based on who benefited the most, clearly it was Dave Grohl. <laughs> He had that first Foo Fighters album one year after Kurt died. You're telling me he wrote that in that year? He didn't have that shit ready to go, and then it was just like, Shh, there goes my hero, and he fucking took him out. <laughs> All the evidence is <laughs> there. I don't really think that, but I thought of that joke, and sometimes comedy gets the best, the best, the best of you, and... <laughs> Got to tell one of those. <laughs> All apologies. Uh, <laughs> should I do more? Never mind. Um, no, I, uh, I, I don't know. He might have, Courtney Love might have killed. I, All I know is that before I was that age, I always wanted to be one of those fucking people that, you know, the 27 club, I always thought they're fucking cool. I was like, yeah, I'll make my mark. And then as soon as you turn 28, you're like, that is way too young. That is way, no, thank God I did not die yet. Like, woof, I haven't even done shit yet. Like, and you just end up, this is all you end up. You end up a fucking uh, mural on a wall outside a coffee shop. That's your legacy. <laughs> As a, you have a couple awesome albums and you're on a bunch of fucking Alfred coffee shop uh, walls. <laughs> Alfred's coffee. No. <laughs> they sponsored the special. Uh, yeah, if you're a white guy and you're on a mural, it means you killed yourself. And if you're a black guy on, on a mural, it means you were also killed by a white guy. That's... <laughs> That's the thing about murals. That's how they work. This is the rule of murals. <laughs> Think about it, like George Floyd, a lot of murals. A lot of murals. Yeah. Got real quiet. I like that. <laughs> I think even he would be surprised. If, he, if the ghost of Christmas fucking future came to him in 2019 and showed him six months in the future, he would just be like, why... Am I on all these paintings with Kobe Bryant? I don't <laughs> know Kobe Bryant. I've never met him. I'm not a Lakers fan. I don't. And who's this little girl? What is she doing? <laughs> I don't know. I, I relate, though. I relate to black culture because I was a child slave. Um, I was. I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm. Uh, I didn't ask for any of that fucking shit, and I had to do work for free uh, my entire fucking life. Well, until I was 18. And I know I was a child slave because as soon as I moved out, they just got machines to do all the shit that we used to do. <laughs> they bought a tractor, a fucking snowblower, a riding lawnmower, as soon as we left. We had horses. Do not trust fucking horses, okay? Horses are, they are not good animals. Um, they're not, anybody here ever ridden a horse before? Yeah. Oh, several guys. Usually it's all women, because that's why we have them. It's their, it's their sex toy, let's be honest. <laughs> horses, not that they fuck them like they're dicks, but like riding them is like every trot is a sneeze. Every trot is just like, that's a little bit of an or For guys, it's like if you, if you got to uh, skinny dip and ride a dolphin. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I'm not coming, but I'm getting there. <laughs> just getting dragged through the ocean by Flipper. We <laughs> that's what women are feeling when they ride a horse. So they're just like, yeah. <laughs> but you can't trust them horses because uh, they sided with humans that why, why the fuck they do that no other animal has really done that even dogs are like we'll hang out with you but no get, get the fuck off me like it 
I think it's because horses used to run this fucking show. Before people came along, horses, one of the top, you know, they were herbivores and shit, but I think they could, they had fucking clubs for feet and a claw face, like a lion would come up and fucking get out of here, lion. And they were just stomping shit. And then all of a sudden people came along and they started seeing people fucking murking saber tooth tigers and shit. And they're like, oh, fuck, we might have a formidable enemy here. And they're like, okay, so it's going to be people versus animals, and we got a side to choose. And then they're like, and animals fucking hate us. So we're going to go <laughs> with people. And they sided with people, and people were like, fuck yeah. Because people, I think they went up to cows and were like, hey, can we ride you? And cows were like, fuck no, man. And they're like, all right, cut them up. And then horses, <laughs> horses saw that shit, and they're like, right over here, buddy, right over here. Before you find out how adhesive we are. And... We're like, all right, we want to ride you, but we want to go fucking kill other animals. And they're like, do ya? We'll show you where they are. Come on. <laughs> horses have been involved in every fucking bad thing. Genghis Khan, horses. <laughs> fucking Nazis, horses. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker is a horse, and her husband killed the guy. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I was a I was a I was a child slave. Uh, one summer they sold me off. Um, they did. Uh, they fooled me. I got accidentally kidnapped. Uh, they sent me to Bible camp. Is what happened. Uh, I had to go to Bible camp. We weren't religious at all. Not at all. Anybody here go to Bible camp? Yeah, yeah. What 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 flavor? Baptist. Yeah. So that was probably like a lot of Bible, not a lot of camp. Yeah, yeah. ours was uh, evangelical. We, we'd never been to church before ever in my fucking life. And uh, my aunt and uncle, who were very religious, had paid for their two kids to go to Bible camp. And then uh, one of them uh, got sick and couldn't go. And so they called my parents, and they were like, we promised two souls. And my parents... <laughs> They were like, we got this fucking third one we don't give a fuck about. Uh, and so they said to me, hey, do you want to go to summer camp next week? Next fucking week. And I was like, hell yeah, I want to go to fucking summer camp. Hell yeah. Because this is like 1997. This is peak, like, uh, camp salute your shorts, uh, heavyweights, uh, Ernest goes to camp. And I was like, I'm going to have a fucking summer camp summer. And then the night before, my mom goes, it's, uh, I got to tell you, it's Bible camp. <laughs> And I was like, I, do, I really don't know what exactly that means. <laughs> and she was like, neither do I. I don't either, but have fun. And I had to go. It was called Camp Good News. <laughs> yeah, it should have been good news asterisks if you believe in Jesus. Otherwise, <laughs> a lot of bad news. It was, I'll be honest, I found out I was going to hell and everybody I loved was going to hell. It was not good news. We got there first day, and they make us uh, immediately go into mass, and the dude just starts going in like heavy evangelical, and he's like, God created everything. And I was like 13. I was like, I would have heard about this by now if that was real. Like, they'd be teaching this in school, and he was like, we're fucking trying, buddy. We are trying. I cried. Uh, I tried to get sent home. They would not send me home. They said, you can write a letter uh, or you can pray. They wouldn't even let me call home. They said, you can write a letter or you can pray. And I was like, I don't think praying is going to work. Just be like, dear Jesus, get me out of your fucking camp. Like, that's <laughs> didn't work in Auschwitz. Not going to work here either. <laughs> and then uh, I did write a letter. I wrote a letter. And then they did not send it to my parents. They didn't. They sent it to my very religious aunt and uncle, who also did not give it to my parents. I don't blame them. I was not nice to them in that letter. I was very <laughs> mean to Janice and Gary, and I apologize. She's trying to show me a little faith. I get it. When my parents came and picked me up, uh, I just remember thinking, why the fuck did you send me here? I asked them, I was like, why did you... Why did you think that was a good idea? Why the fuck did you, like, we're not religious at all. That was terrible. It was mostly just reading the Bible and memorizing the Bible and working for free. That, that was the other part of it, was you just did a lot of work around the place for fucking free. And my parents were just like, hey, you know, 
we don't go to church, but we thought maybe you'd be into it. We thought maybe <laughs> it would be a thing you were into, uh, you know, like wakeboarding. They thought I was going to pick up evangelical religion <laughs> like it was fucking wakeboarding. And I was just like, what were you going to do with that kid then? What, what if I came back fucking all in? <laughs> now, every Sunday, I'm like, wake up, heathens. <laughs> It's time to take me to church. Come on, you asked for this. You fucking sent me. Yeah, I was. That's immediately when I knew I gotta fucking give up on these two. These two do not have my back at all. And uh, I did. I, I just was like, I'm on my own from here on out. And then the next year, I fucked a 13 year old. Uh, <laughs> Got to blame that one on the church. I was 14. It's always important to point that out. I guess I realized that nobody can stop me. Anybody got a lighter? Give it up for your Lord and Savior, Joe Biden, everybody. My dad loves this one. I'm telling this for him. Are you not Americans? That is our president. Thank you. Yeah. I don't care what side of the political divide you fucking stand on. I think we can all agree he is the happiest president ever. Right? <laughs> he gets to wake up every day and find out he's president. Are you fucking kidding me? Imagine his life where he's just like sleeping and then he wakes up and he's like, Oh, where am I? Where am I? And he starts looking around. He's like, Oh, I'm in Barack's room. Oh, you know, I've... Uh, pass out here again? Oh, no. And then a nurse comes in, fucking injects him with adrenochrome, and he fucking pops up, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa what's happening? And they're like, Mr. President. He's like, Brock is here, okay. And they're like, no, man, fucking you. And he's like, what? What happened? How am I president? And they're like, it's 2020. You fucking what? And he's like, I wasn't supposed to live this long. No! I feel like he's like Idi Amin, where like he was like, I know the day I'm gonna die. And then he's just being kept alive now. And he's like, I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> and then he's just like, what have I done? And then they just play him a tape of everything that's happened so far. It's like 50 first dates, but with a president. As 51st Statesman, and then by the end of it, he's like, oh, I love Adam Sandler. <laughs> but, thank God, we have a vice president that nobody fucking likes, and so everybody's like, hold on, Joe! Fucking hold on! Any uh, Kamala fans here? We got any? No? no? Dude, come on. You didn't need to go there. <laughs> no, it's weird. She's the most hated vice president of all time. Yeah, Aaron Burr killed a guy. And still, people, you know that Aaron Burr, he killed uh, Hamilton, the Puerto Rican rapper. And still, people hate fucking her more. It's crazy. But I think it is a good thing because uh, I, you know, I have a little girl. I like there being a woman vice president. I actually saw a, a t shirt that uh, said this. It was her walking down the street, and just like this, there was a shadow, and uh, the shadow was a little girl. It was a little black girl, her shadow, a little black girl, and I was like, that's why Biden picked her. You know, he can smell it in there. Um, <laughs> and then underneath it said, finally, uh, a vice president that looks like me, and I was like, that is good. Having a, a little daughter like I do, it's nice to have somebody to look up to. And if that little black girl is from the Bay Area, she probably doesn't have a father to look up to thanks to that <laughs> vice president. So it's real, it's nice that she has a vice president to look up to. All right, that's it for me, you guys. Thank you. Yeah.